Howdy, howdy, folks. Once again, this is Donnie coming at you with another do 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 Linux security report. And in this video, I'd like to look at a piece of sensationalism in the tech news. Yes, what would we do without sensationalism and clickbait headlines? So here we have an article about new Linux crypto miner that steals your root password, disables your antivirus, it also installs a rootkit and another strain of malware that can execute distributed denial of service attacks. So let's take a look at this. So it starts out talking about how malware that targets Linux, it's not as widespread as malware that targets Windows, but that the Linux malware is becoming very complex and multifunctional. And the latest example is a new Trojan discovered just this month by the Russian antivirus maker, Dr. Webb. So this new malware doesn't have a distinctive name yet, but despite the generic name, the Trojan is a little bit more complex than most Linux malware, mainly because of the plethora of malicious features that it includes. So the Trojan itself, a giant shell script, over a thousand lines of codes, yes, Malicious malware written in bash shell scripting. Who would have thought? But the script is executed on an infected Linux system, and the first thing it does is find a folder on a disk to which it has write permissions so that it can copy itself and later use to download other modules. Once the Trojan has a foothold, it uses one of these two privilege escalation exploits. One of them is the dirty cow exploit to get root permissions and have full access to the operating system. Remember these two exploits. We're going to talk about these exploits in just a few moments. The Trojan then sets itself up as a local daemon, even downloads the NoHub utility to achieve the operation if the utility is not already present. After the Trojan has a firm grasp on the infected host, it moves on to executing its primary function for which it was designed which is cryptocurrency mining. It first scans and terminates the processes of several rival cryptocurrency mining malware families, and then downloads and starts its own Monero mining operation. It also downloads and runs another piece of malware known as the Bill Gates Trojan, a known distributed denial of service malware strain, but which also comes with many backdoor-like functions. However, even with all this, it's still not done. The Trojan will look for process names associated with Linux-based antivirus solutions and will kill their execution. So the Dr. Webb researchers say they've seen the Trojan stop antivirus processes that has names such as SafeDog, Aegis, Yansuo, uh, hmm, I have no idea what that one is, Man, and all the others. You can read them there, right? But even after setting itself up as a daemon, getting root permissions via known exploits, and installing the Bill Gates malware with its backdoor capabilities, the Trojan's operators still aren't happy with their level of access to the infected host. So according to Dr. Webb, the Trojan also adds itself as an auto-run entry to files like etcrc.local and all the others there, and then downloads and runs a rootkit. The rootkit component has even more intrusive features, experts said, such as the ability to steal user entered passwords for the SU command and to hide files in the file system, network connections, and running processes. Well, that's like typical rootkit, okay? Nothing special about that. And that's quite the impressive list of malicious functions, but it's still not done. It also runs a function that collects information about all the remote servers the infected host has connected to via secure shell and will try to connect to those machines as well to spread itself to even more systems. So this secure shell self-spreading mechanism is believed to be the Trojan's main distribution channel because the Trojan also relies on stealing valid secure shell credentials. This means that even if some Linux admins are careful to properly secure their server's secure shell connections and only allow a selected number of hosts to connect, they might not be able to prevent an infection if one of those selected hosts has been infected without his knowledge. 
Dr. Webb has uploaded SHA-1 file hashes for the Trojan's various components on GitHub in case some sysadmins want to scan their systems for the presence of this relatively new threat. And, of course, it gives a link there to uh, lead you to more on Dr. Webb's analysis, and which we're not going to bother to look at right now. So this is Linux malware. Yes, Linux malware. So just how serious is this anyway? Well, according to that article, yeah, it sounds pretty serious, right? But here's the reality. It could be serious. Yeah, it could be serious, right? It can escalate to root user privileges. It can disable antivirus. It can turn your computer into a mining machine for someone else. And it can install a rootkit. Rootkits are always bad news. You never want to see one. But here's the reality. For one thing, it's not a virus, which means it doesn't just get automatically installed on your computer. Okay, yeah, it's got that self-spreading mechanism with Secure Shell, but that's still not virus-like behavior. In order to get a virus, all you got to do is just, like, uh, visit a website that has these virus infections on it. And the virus then will automatically download and get installed on your computer. Or you just stick some sort of infected media into your computer. You don't even have to actively access the media. Just stick it in. Now, back in the day, that used to be done with floppy disks. I got my old DOS computer infected with the stoned virus once just by in inserting an infected floppy disk into the computer. Didn't even have to, to, to uh, you know, do a directory listing or manually transfer any files like that. The virus was there just by sticking that floppy disk into the computer and letting the computer mount that floppy disk. It's all I needed, right? But that's something that happens on DOS and Windows. It doesn't really happen with Linux. Linux is a whole different ball game from DOS and Windows. It's just designed better. So you're not going to get these types of malware infections, you know, just by, you know, doing something simple like sticking in an affected storage media. So the only way you're going to get this malware installed is either for you to install software from an untrustworthy source. I mean, in other words, you have to actively install it yourself, or for someone else to break into your system and install it. It's not going to get installed any other way. And then for this to escalate to root user privileges, you have to be running a Linux machine that hasn't been updated for the past few years. Because remember, on that one screen I showed you, it said that it can take advantage of these two exploits that have been found in the Linux kernel in order to escalate its privileges to root user privileges. Now, both of those exploits have already been patched. They were patched years ago. And one of the mistakes that Linux operators make is bragging about how long they can keep their machines running without having to reboot. Yeah, and Linux is like that because the memory management is a lot better than it is in Windows. With Windows, yeah, you, you got to reboot every once in a while, right? Uh, you, you, you can't keep a Windows machine going really for long term, but you can do that with Linux. You can keep a Linux machine going for years, unless the hardware breaks, of course. You can keep a Linux machine going for years without rebooting because the memory management is a lot better. It, it frees up the memory a, a lot better. You don't get memory leaks and all that stuff, right? So you can keep the machine going for years. But if you do that, hey, you're seriously screwing up because you're not getting your updates installed. And a lot of those updates do require you to reboot the machine. So you've just got to keep the machine updated. And for anybody who's updated the machine, hey, this really, or this aspect of this piece of malware, at least, that's not a problem. It's not going to happen, right? So... Is it really serious? Yeah. yeah, it could be, as I said, but not really. As long as you observe proper security precautions, proper security procedures. So 
don't install your software from shady sources. Okay? I mean, that should be a given, right? And then in order to keep the intruders out, keep your security locked down. And you can have your secure shell, for example, have that configured in such a way so that it's not using the, the common username and password method of logging into the system. You keep it configured so that people have to use security keys in order to log in. That's going to keep a lot of the intruders out, right? And make sure the security keys have good, strong passphrases associated with them. And that'll keep the intruders out. And that will also, even if an intruder were to break in, that then would prevent the machines from being able to, to just replicate this using their, their uh, uh, secure shell type replication mechanism. And then, of course, keep your system updated. So, with all that said, it's time for a word from my sponsor, which is me and my Mastering Linux Security and Hardening book. And if you want to learn security, this is a good way to do it. And, of course, you got to learn security, right? you just got to. It's good for your business, good for your career advancement, good for possible pay raises. Learn security. You really want to. And this book of mine has a lot of really, really good security tips in it and a lot of good security recipes that you can implement on your system and good practical advice. And it's written in an entertaining manner. I don't do boring books. You shouldn't either. Hey, want to be entertained while you learn? This is a book to do it. And for a limited time during this cyber week of November 2018, you can get the ebook copy for only $10. You can also get an accompanying video course for only $10 as well. So check it out. Links for purchase will be in the video description below. So that's all I got for today. If you like the video, be sure to like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time.